from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi everyone, this turnout is wonderful. We're so happy to see all your faces here today. Um, thank you all for joining uh, this Thursday evening. And thanks to our presenting partners, the Asian American Literary Review, the Asian American Studies Program at the University of Maryland, and the Smithsonian Asian Pacific Center. My name is Anya Kreitney and I'm the Program Specialist at the Poetry and Literature Center, which is housed in the Library of Congress. I'm also a proud partner in this series, representing and celebrating Asian American literature throughout the country. I'm gonna do a little bit of housekeeping reminders and then tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center and then I'll turn it over to Mimi who will introduce Viet. So the biggest housekeeping item is to turn off your cell phones or anything that would interrupt the reading this evening. And then also note that participating in today's performance, you agree um, to give us permission for future use of this recording. And the second piece of things, which you guys should see on your seats, are surveys. And in an ongoing effort to learn more about our audiences, we are now um, having these surveys at the events, and they are important for funding and for um, having these events, these types of events throughout the, the literary calendar. So please tell us how you came, and uh, that would be great. And lastly, a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center. We are the home of the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, currently Juan Felipe Herrera, and we put on 30 to 40 public programs just like this one a year. And to find out more about this particular series and also other um, events throughout this year, take a look at the website. Um, you can visit us at www.loc.gov slash poetry. And finally, I'm going to turn it over to Mimi Cook, lecturer in the Asian American Studies program at the University of Maryland. Mimi? Thank you. Hi, so I teach a course at the University of Maryland on Vietnamese Americans. Our histories, our experiences, our dreams, our nightmares. I begin with war. Two thirds way through the semester now, we are still talking about war. And in a few weeks when the semester closes, we will end with war. Because as Viet Thanh Nguyen writes in a recent New York Times essay, our Vietnam War never ended. My students, many of whom are here tonight, have been journeying through Vietnamese American tellings of war and its legacies. In these tellings, we've asked not only how has war shaped Vietnamese diasporic experience, but also who is doing the telling? Who is doing the listening? What exactly is being remembered? And what meanings are being made in these practices of remembrance? The politics of memory, the politics of meaning. In that New York Times essay, Viet writes that anniversaries are times for war stories to be told. And he makes the argument that family stories, the stories of refugees, immigrants, loved ones separated, homelands lost, new beginnings in new places, these are war stories, rarely heard, rarely asked to be told. So this year, on the 40th anniversary of the fall of Saigon. What war stories are being told? Viet Thanh Nguyen, in his novel The Sympathizer, offers us a new war story, an exciting reimagining and retelling of the Vietnam War and its complex aftermath. Here are new perspectives offered, new meanings made, new understandings of war, its machinations, its costs, its legacies. Viet Thanh Nguyen is Associate Press Professor of English and American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. Along with his first novel, The Sympathizer, he's the author of Race and Resistance, Literature and Politics in Asian America, and has a forthcoming book titled Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War. Please join me in welcoming Viet Thanh Nguyen. Thank you for that introduction, Mimi. Thank, I also want to thank uh, Lawrence Ninboy Davis for bringing me out here to the Library of Congress. 
Anya and the Library of Congress for hosting me and all of you for being here tonight. I know many of you are students of various classes and I greatly appreciate your presence. Um, I'm going to read a couple of scenes from The Sympathizer. It'll take about 10 minutes, and but you know, after that, we'll have a conversation with Mimi and with the audience. I really enjoy actually talking to people and getting their questions and hearing their feedback and their, their, their other opinions about this history that we're dealing with or, or with the novel. And for those of you <clears throat> who aren't familiar with the book, The Sympathizer begins in April 1975 with the fall or liberation of Saigon, depending on your point of view. And our hero, or anti-hero, is a communist spy in the South Vietnamese army. And his mission is to flee with the remnants of that army to the United States, where he is to s report on their efforts to take back their homeland. And this is, in many ways, inspired by real events in Vietnamese and Vietnamese American history. You know, one of the things that happens to him, though, when he comes to the United States is that he has to make a living. And one of the jobs that he uh, gets is to become the <coughs> authenticity consultant on the making of a American war epic that looks suspiciously like Apocalypse Now. So in the first thing that I'm going to read, it actually takes place after his initial meeting with the director of this movie, known only as the Otor, and he's going to meet, uh, our narrator is going to meet his boss, the general, and the general's wife, the madam, and they'll talk a little bit about what happened and we'll also uh, encounter the Otor as well. After I descended from the auteur's home to the general's, I reported my first experience with the motion picture industry to the general and madam, both of whom were infuriated on my behalf. My meeting with the auteur had gone on for a while longer, mostly in a more subdued fashion, with me pointing out that the lack of speaking parts for Vietnamese people in a movie set in Vietnam might be interpreted as cultural insensitivity. Do you not think it would be a little more believable, I said to the auteur, a little more realistic, a little more authentic, for a movie set in a certain country, for the people in that country to have something to say, instead of having your screenplay direct, as it does now, cut to villagers speaking in their own language? Do you think it might not be decent to let them actually say something instead of simply acknowledging that there is some kind of sound coming from their mouths? Could you not even just have them speak a heavily accented English? You know what I mean, ching chong English? Just to pretend they are speaking in an Asian language that somehow American audiences can strangely understand? The auteur grimaced and said, very interesting. Great stuff, loved it, but I had a question. What was it? Oh, yes. How many movies have you made? None. Isn't that right? None? Zero? Zilch? Nada? Nothing? And however you say it in your language? So thank you for telling me how to do my job. Now get the hell out of my house and come back after you've made a movie or two. Maybe then I'll listen to one or two of your cheap ideas. Why was he so rude, Madam said. Didn't he ask you to give him some comments? He was looking for a yes man. He thought I'd give him a rubber stamp of approval. He thought you were going to fawn over him. When I didn't do it, he was hurt. He's an artist, he's got thin skin. So much for your career in Hollywood, the general said. I don't want a career in Hollywood, I said, which was true only to the extent Hollywood did not want me. I confess to being angry with the auteur but was I wrong in being angry? This was especially the case when he acknowledged he did not even know that Montagnard was simply a French catch-all term for the dozens of Highland minorities. What if, I said to him, I wrote a screenplay about the American West and simply called all the natives Indians? You'd want to know whether the cavalry was fighting the Navajo or the Apache or Comanche, right? Likewise, I would want to know, when you say these people in your film are Montagnards, whether we speak of the brew, or the nung, or the tay. Let me tell you a secret, the auteur said. You ready? Here it is. No one gives a shit. He was amused 
by my wordlessness. To see me without words is like seeing one of those Egyptian felines without hair, a rare and not necessarily desirable occasion. How could I be so dense? How could I be so deluded? I naively believed that I could divert the Hollywood organism from its goal, the simultaneous lobotomization and pickpocketing of the world's audiences. Hollywood did not just make horror movie monsters, it was its own horror movie monster, smashing me under its foot. I had failed, and the auteur would make the Hamlet as he intended, with my countrymen merely serving as raw material for an epic about white men saving good yellow people from bad yellow people. I pitied the French for their naivete in believing they had to visit a country in order to exploit it. Hollywood was much more efficient, imagining the countries it wanted to exploit. I was maddened by my helplessness before the auteur's imagination and machinations. His arrogance marked something new in the world, for this was the first war where the losers would write history instead of the victors, courtesy of the most efficient propaganda machine ever created. With all due respect to Joseph Goebbels and the Nazis, who never achieved global domination. Hollywood's high priests understood innately the observation of Milton's Satan, that it was better to rule in hell than serve in heaven, better to be villain, loser, or anti-hero than virtuous extra, so long as one commanded the bright lights of center stage. In this forthcoming Hollywood trompe all the Vietnamese of any side would come out poorly herded into the roles of the poor, the innocent, the evil, or the corrupt. Our fate was not to be merely mute. We were to be struck dumb. So he becomes involved, or he is involved, with the general's family. And he falls in love with the general's daughter, which is not something that he should do. And in the next scene, he's going to have, you know, he's going to meet this general's daughter, Lana. And this takes place in a nightclub. And if you know anything about Vietnamese people, you know we love nightclubs. We know we, you know, we love uh, music and song and dance and, and all that good stuff. And, you know, if you grew up in the Vietnamese community, you, you've seen Paris by Night videos. Uh, that the Vietnamese people, one of the earliest things that they did upon coming to California, Southern California, not only did they start a nightclub in Los Angeles, but they eventually began a song and dance venue uh, called Paris by Night, which is now in over 100 episodes, you know, filmed globally and available everywhere. And I saw a lot of this when I was growing up. So this next scene is inspired by uh, Paris by Night, except it takes place in a club called Fantasia. Now known by just one name, like John, Paul, George, Ringo, and Mary, Lana stepped on stage, clad in a red velvet bustier, a leopard print miniskirt, black lace gloves, and thigh-high leather boots with stiletto heels. My heart would have paused at the boots, the heels, or the flat, smooth slice of her belly, naked in between miniskirt and bustier. But the combination of all three arrested my heart altogether and beat it with the vigor of the Los Angeles police squad. Pouring cognac over my heart freed it, but thus drenched it was easily flambéed by her torch song. She turned on the heat with her first number, the unexpected I'd love you to want me, which I'd heard before sung only by men. I'd love you to want me was the theme song of the bachelors and unhappily married males of my generation, whether in the English original or the equally superb French and Vietnamese renditions. What the song expressed so perfectly from lyric to melody was unrequited love. And we men of the South love nothing more than unrequited love. Cracked hearts are primary weakness after cigarettes, coffee, and cognac. Listening to Lana sing, all I wanted was to immolate myself in a night with her to remember forever and ever. Every man in the room shared my emotion as we watched her do no more than sway at the microphone. Her voice enough to move the audience, or rather, to still us. Nobody talked and nobody stirred except to raise a cigarette or a glass, an utter concentration not broken for her next, slightly more upbeat number, bang, bang, my baby shot me down. 
Lana's version of Bang Bang layered English with French and Vietnamese. The last lines of the French version echoed Fat Zui's Vietnamese version, We Will Never Forget. In the pantheon of classic pop songs from Saigon, this tricolor rendition was one of the most memorable, masterfully weaving together love and violence in the enigmatic story of two lovers who, regardless of having known each other since childhood, or because of knowing each other since childhood, shoot each other down. Bang, bang was the sound of memory's pistol firing into our heads, for we could not forget love. We could not forget war. We could not forget lovers. We could not forget enemies. We could not forget home. And we could not forget Saigon. We could not forget the caramel flavor of iced coffee with coarse sugar, the bowls of noodle soup eaten while squatting on the sidewalk, the strumming of a friend's guitar while we swayed on hammocks under coconut trees, the whisper of a dewy lover saying the most seductive words in our language, an oi. The working men who slept in their seclos on the streets, kept warm only the by the memories of their families, the refugees who slept on every sidewalk of every city, the sweetness and firmness of a mango plucked fresh from its tree, the girls who refused to talk to us and who we only pine for more, the men who had died or disappeared, the streets and homes blown away by bombshells, the streams where we swam naked and laughing, the, street, the secret groves where we spied on the nymphs who bathed and splashed with the innocence of the birds, the shadows cast by this candlelight on the walls of wattled huts, the barking of a hungry dog in an abandoned village, the appetizing reek of the fresh durian one wept to eat, the sight and sound of orphans howling by the dead bodies of their mothers and fathers, the stickiness of one's shirt by afternoon, the stickiness of one's lover by the end of lovemaking, the stickiness of our situations. And while the list could go on and on and on, the point was simply this. The most important thing we could never forget was that we could never forget. Thank you. Thank you for that reading, Viet. That was wonderful. Um, I have a few questions I want to ask you. So your book comes now uh, 40 years after the end of the Vietnam War and after over 40 years of American tellings of the war, but also um, after a kind of blossoming of Vietnamese American voices, I think in the last <coughs> decade or two. Um, and I wanted to know where you see your work in the context not just of American war stories, but also Vietnamese-American interventions more recently? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things you know, I should acknowledge is that I don't read Vietnamese. So there's a whole body of Vietnamese-American literature written in Vietnamese mm -hmm. that I've rarely begun to get acquainted with. Um, the Vietnamese-American literature you're talking about is written in English, mm -hmm. and it's written by people mostly like us, you know, uh, 1.5 generation people who were born in Vietnam but raised here in the United States. and uh, you know, the, benefit, the beneficiaries of the American educational system, and, and, and they, want, they write wonderful books in English about what it means to be a Vietnamese refugee, what it means to be a Vietnamese American. In some cases, uh, they write about uh, life in South Vietnam uh, and what uh, life during the wartime was like. So I do want to see my, my work as being in conversation with all of these writers. And you know, last night you were at an event with me and, and Mo Monique Jung and many other writers. Uh, but you know, Monique wrote The Book of Saul, and um, and, and another novel whose title just completely escapes me at the moment, Bitter in the Mouth. Yes. And one of the things she said was, you know, she's glad that there's more than one Vietnamese American author because there are more than, there's more than one Vietnamese American perspective. And that's absolutely right. And the fact that there are many of us writing now takes the pressure off of any one of us to have to speak for the entire Vietnamese American population. Because if you know anything about Vietnamese Americans, we don't really agree about a whole lot of things. There's a lot of stories out there. And we actually, you know, even as, that we have, have had many authors publishing, I think we still need more. Hopefully there will be some among you who will be writing these other stories. So speaking of us not agreeing with each other very often <laughs> in the community, um, the question that I had and, and my students had, we had a lively discussion about your book, uh, is why a sympathizer? 
why um, a person with either mixed loyalties or, or um, co co you know, conflicting loyalties, and somebody with loyalties that um, don't align with many of the loyalties in the Vietnamese American community. Well, I mean, partially it was historical because if you, you know the novel is most much of the novel is based on real historical events inspired by some real historical personages, and there there were many Vietnamese spies, including what a very famous one, Pham Suan An, who came to the United States in the 1950s, studied in Orange County, went back and became, you know, so successful as a spy that none of his American friends, who were in the very highest ranks of journalism and so on, and and uh, the government, were aware that he was a spy who became a major general during that period, he was so good at what he was doing. But he was, he was a sympathizer in the sense that he was very sympathetic to Americans, mm -hmm. in addition to being a revolutionary, communist revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And he could see both sides as partly what made him a great spy. And so that, the novel is partially inspired by that. So by inspired by people who really did have sympathies for everybody who was involved. And it's, I wanted to have that perspective because growing up in the Vietnamese American community, it was very obvious that there was not a lot of sympathy going around. Vietnamese refugees, Vietnamese Americans are very sympathetic to themselves, <laughs> as are most people. You know, most of us like ourselves. We want to. We are. We know exactly what we feel, and we feel like everybody else doesn't understand us, and that's what Vietnamese Americans go through for for very legitimate reason. But that lack of sympathy for others, I think, is one of the things that leads us to war, to conflict, and prevents us from reconciliation because we don't want to see the viewpoints of people who might be opposed to us. And so that's part of the, what I, the work that I wanted to do in the novel, is to have a character who was capable of seeing from many different perspectives, because he would not be trapped in what I see as a problem in the Vietnamese American community, which is that people are so focused on their own stories, they can't listen to anybody else's story. right? And it keeps the community trapped in a particular point in the past. Now that's not to say that having sympathy for all sides is a great thing, because as our narrator says at the beginning of the book, this is one talent, but it's also going to be the one talent that gets him into a very difficult situation by the end of the book, because we live in a world where people want us to take sides, and if you don't take a side, you're likely to be the first person to get shot during the revolution or any kind of conflict. Thank you. Um, Something else, that, something else that my students and I have been talking about is thinking about um, Vietnamese American stories, um, and this ties into your, uh, your kind of critiques of the Vietnamese American community um, and the ways we tell stories. But I'm wondering about the role of Vietnamese American stories in um, Asian American literature, or Asian American kind of cultural production more broadly. Like, do you, where do you see kind of the Vietnamese American um, relationship to a larger kind of Asian American writing world? <coughs> well, you know, Asian Americans have been writing for a long time, um, since the late 19th century and publishing in English. And the diversity of Asian American <coughs> stories is incredible. It's really hard to say that there's one kind of Asian American story, but the way that it's tended to be read, um, well, there's two ways that it's read. You know, people who are not Asian Americans say, you know, when, when, when they discover that you or I are doing Asian American literature, they say, hmm, hey, Amy Tan, right? And so that's the Asian American story for most of America, I think, the, the Amy Tan kind of story where Asia bad, Asian men bad, Asian fathers really bad, uh, <laughs> white guys good, America good, uh, we come to America to succeed. And, um, uh, you know, that's not this book. And so the book is definitely a reaction against that. But then those of us who specialize in Asian American literature, I think we, the, our, our version of it is that, you know, Asian American stories are important because they express a history that many Americans don't know, and they are important for carrying out social justice. You know, a lot of horrible things have happened to Asian Americans in the last century and a half, and most Americans, and a lot of Asian Americans, don't know anything about that. But the, the problem with Vietnamese American literature is that it does do all that kind of stuff. It does do the Amy Tan stuff, some of it, and it does do the social justice storytelling aspect. But another thing that, the Vietnamese, that Vietnamese American stories tell that I think Asian Americans are perhaps uncomfortable with is, that it's a lot of it's sort of anti-communist, you know, because a lot of many Vietnamese Americans are here because they were they objected to the communist regime, and um, that's a little bit more difficult for many Asian American academics or critics to deal with because a lot of a lot of us 
have these Marxist leanings because of the history of how Asian Americans were formed. So Vietnamese American literature really exists at a juncture of a lot of different contradictions because it also appeals to wider American audiences who want to hear the stories of Vietnamese Americans and want to hear an anti-communist story. Mm -hmm. So Vietnamese American literature, Vietnamese American literature is caught under different kinds of pressures from different kind of audiences, including Asian Americans. Um, for me, as you know, as a Vietnamese American writer myself, um, I so so my graduate work was also thinking about Vietnamese uh, the Vietnam War and um, the way it's remembered and memory practices. And part of my uh, reasoning for why I chose that for my graduate work was thinking of myself very much as a Vietnamese American daughter, as a Vietnamese American um, from the community, and how do I pay homage to <coughs> my parents and to the community and what they've experienced. Um, and in some ways, I think of this book a little bit as about you being a Vietnamese American son, coming from a Vietnamese American family. Um, but both of us became parents recently, <laughs> ourselves. And now my writing has definitely shifted in terms of becoming a mother and thinking of myself as a Vietnamese American mother now and what does that mean? Um, and so I'm wondering, um, I love <coughs> your last sentence of your book in the acknowledgments. Um, you mentioned your son and how he came right on time. And last night you mentioned that you finished the draft, uh, was it the day before? The day before he was born? Two days before. Two days before he was born. Um, so I'm wondering, for you in writing this book and in writing about the community, um, how does like, that play into your fatherhood? Or how does being the American father um, relate to the kind of work that you're doing? Um, I mean, that's, that, a good, that that's, a, no, that that's a good question. It's an emotional question because you know, I grew up in the Vietnamese American community in San Jose. And you know, you, I, I, all of us who, who did that, you know, we grew up surrounded by the stories of our parents and our elders, and um, oftentimes very tragic and, and horrible stories, you know. And certainly the sense was that the stories of our community and especially of our parents' generation weren't, weren't being heard by the larger American community who didn't care about, about these people. And so for many of us who became writers, the idea, the idea was, you know, we're, you know, we're going to carry out this, this storytelling uh, partially for our parents, our elders, and, and, this, and this Vietnamese American community. But at the same time, there's an, I think it's also a, 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 a risky kind of work that we do because we're quite aware that sometimes our parents don't want these stories told mm -hmm. or not told the way we, we want to tell them or that when we tell stories at our household, they're like, you know, who cares what you, what you have to say, et cetera. It's not, you know. So there's, it's, it's, not just, it's not just a virtuous thing that we do. You know, it's a very fraught thing that we do. And partially it's fraught because I think uh, yeah, there's a whole other discourse happening in Vietnamese, the language itself, versus in English. And, and, and our, our, that community, our, gener our older generation, have a different set of concerns. So when I, when I went home after the book was published and I gave my dad uh, a copy of the book, um, I told him, you know, Dad, this is the plot. It's about a communist spy in Vietnamese, all right? And you said that in Vietnamese. I said it in Vietnamese. And then, but my dad didn't say anything because I don't think he ever listens to me, right? <laughs> so I didn't register. Uh, and then later he said, I want you to take a picture of me with your book because he was proud of the book and proud of me as a writer uh, who had gotten this sort of attention. But even to this point, I'm not, I, I yeah, sent him, he read it, that's I, I, I sent, and I sent him a, a Vietnamese translation of the New York Times book review that talks about the plot of the book. He never responded, so I have no idea what that means. Um, this is the typical relationship between me and my dad, right? Uh, he claims I don't listen to him and I claim he doesn't listen to me. Um, and then um, in, in terms of my son, I think that, uh, I, I found out, you know, we were going to have a kid in the middle of writing the book, and I thought, oh my God, I have got to finish this book before he comes out because after that I'm not going to get anything done. And so that was the real deadline. I managed to do that. And so being a dad wasn't really on my mind as I wrote the book, even though as you get to the end of the book, there's all this stuff about a baby. Mm -hmm. I completely imagined that. But then lo and behold, it all came true because <laughs> babies really suck sometimes, and they really do scream constantly sometimes. And that, that happened to me. I thought, oh, I, I was right in imagining this. Um, but I think that being a dad certainly uh, has been transformative, and you know I'm I'm writing another uh, novel, and and um, and it's a sequel, and I, I I feel like I do have to take a different kinds of emotional things into consideration now mm. for my protagonist because of the things that I've experienced too. Would you want Ellison to read the book? Um, 
When he gets older. When he gets older, you He's know, there's two. stuff there that's definitely R-rated in the book. Yes. Um, but as I was telling some of the some of the uh, students in the class, when I was 10 or 12, I was reading stuff I should not have read, and it scarred me for life. But it also it really, made you a writer. It made me a writer, you know. Be, but it was actually important that that happened. I think it's important that we expose our children to stuff that we think they may might not be able to handle because that's the way the world is, and. I, I did it on my own. I went to the library. I read, I read all kinds of stuff that if my son was reading it, I would be like, do not touch those books, you know. But that made me who I am. And probably it would be better if I had the kind of parents who, who, who knew that I was doing that and who could have a conversation with me. Exactly. So I would rather that Ellison read all kinds of terrible stuff as long as he could talk to me about it. Yeah. I like how you refer to your book as terrible stuff. <laughs> for Ellison to read. It's, 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 yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to see, see him doing some of the stuff that my narrator does in the book, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's open up to the audience for questions um, as we can have a larger conversation. Uh, yes, in, in your uh, um, opening remarks, you mentioned that uh, uh, I guess the phrase that uh, we should never forget. Um, so I was thinking, uh, you know, given that this is the 40th, the 40th uh, anniversary of the war, and your book came out on the anniversary, um, what lessons uh, or themes you know, should we remember or think about when we think about Vietnam? Wow, that's a hard question. Um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll give two, I think. Um, one is that it's important for us, whether we're Americans or Vietnamese or some other population, to be capable of seeing from the perspectives of others. This is not just an American problem, right? I mean, Americans are self-centered and they're ethnocentric and all of that kind of stuff, but so is everybody else. I've never gone to a country where people weren't ethnocentric and self-centered, including Vietnamese people. And yet, the lessons of war tell us that this is partly why we go to wars, is that we don't see from the perspectives of others. And every war teaches us that, teaches us that same lesson, and we never learn. So I don't think the Vietnam, war, the Vietnam War did teach us that lesson. It's out there, but many of us choose not to study it. The other, maybe other lesson is, um, We're fighting wars today, Americans are, and it's partially a consequence of not having studied American history in Vietnam and into, into China. But it's true for Vietnam too. You know, the, you know, stuff is happening in the South China Sea now that involves Vietnam, China, and the United States. And it's bringing up not just the past 40 years of, 50 years of Vietnamese and American history, but a thousand years of Vietnamese and Chinese history. So the same lessons are applicable there too. You would think we would learn our lesson after a thousand years of conflict, but we haven't really. Um, so I don't think anybody's actually going to get that lesson out of reading this book, but that's what I would hope. Mr. Wynn, uh, early in your book, yeah, I felt like you were trying to I, I, you alluded to social justice in the talk earlier. You alluded, uh, you, you met, I felt like you were trying to make a point of that Vietnamese Americans were having difficulties uh, trying to be themselves and adjusting to be in America because of the various social uh, pressures, you know, whether it's being a mild minority or the you know, perpetual foreigner, uh, yellow peril, and so forth. Uh, how important is it that you make this point uh, in your books? Uh, and it, it, did you do this on purpose? As, as, uh, as, and is this kind of based on your own life experience as growing up as a Vietnamese American? And following question, I think you don't mind, is that uh, you use, you, a lot of your, some of your characters use the term Oriental in referring to uh, Vietnamese and other Asians. Uh, you know, I, I think it's not quite as demeaning as a lot of racial slurs, but I think it is somewhat derogatory to a lot of, a lot of Asian Americans. I don't know why you use that term. <coughs> you know, when I was growing up, uh, one, of my, one, of my, my, one of my dad's businesses was called 
the Oriental Funding Corporation in the 1980s didn't strike me as a problem at the time. I think I looked at it and I was like, hmm, interesting term, but it wasn't, you know, I didn't have a political consciousness when I was 10, right? And so the novel, um, because it's a novel and not my academic work, I'm not, I'm kind of bound by the, the, the realities that my narrator confronts and the world that he's living in. And so this is a world in which it's perfectly acceptable to call people a Negro, which happens in the book, or an Oriental, and that's not meant as a derogatory thing. So that's one of the reasons, that's what I mean, that's a major reason why it's there, just to capture the flavor of that time. And, um, uh, you know, one of my friends who grew up in the 1970s in the United States said, hey, this is what it was like if you were an Asian American. People called you an Oriental and, and, and had all kinds of stereotypes, and it was, it was meant to be complimentary, these kinds of stereotypes, right? The other question about social justice and literature, um, uh, I was an English major as an undergraduate, but I never would have gone on to study literature professionally, which I did do to get my PhD, without the belief that social justice could be a part of the world of literature, of literary critics and of writers. And the, so it wasn't, what I did was I became an ethnic studies major as well. And it was really through ethnic studies uh, studying the experiences of Asian Americans, Chicanos, Latinos, that I felt that I could see that the study of literature and the writing of literature could be more than aesthetic, could be more than artistic. All that is important, you know, being able to write a good sentence or plot, or do a good plot, that's really important. But what was important to me also was to tell a story that I felt mattered historically and politically, that a story, that a story could do justice for people who, who had no justice done for them, you know? And that's always been my conviction since I was, you know, 20 years old, and, and I've tried to carry that through in the writing of the novel and in my work as a, as a literary and cultural critic and then in my work as a teacher, too, because I think that, it, that that kind of conviction does matter for a lot of people, for a lot of students, especially minority students of any kind, whatever, whatever how you define minority, you know? And it's not true in general, I think, for the larger, literary world, at least in the United States, where to talk about politics, to talk about social justice, talk about race, that's not actually something that most people in the literary world want to do. So it's still necessary for, 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 for those of us who believe that literature and social justice intersect to keep on with that work. Oh, one of the most fascinating parts I found about your book was that one of the most blatant racist characters in the professor is also gay. And there's a lot of sort of underlying homoeroticism between the sympathizer and some of the other male characters in the novel. So I'm wondering uh, what, if any, commentary sexuality can provide on constructions of racial identity. Good question. I think um, really important because it's impossible to extricate sexuality from anything. You know, half the people in this room are having sexual fantasies right now. Um, <laughs> maybe that's just me. Um, <laughs> I just had a sexual fantasy, no. Um, but no, I mean, sexuality is intrinsic to so much of what we do and, and how we view culture, how we, how we view class, how we view race. A considerable portion of you are uh, naval midshipmen at the military academy and it, for me, when I look at how wars are conducted, uh, even, even just talking specifically about the United States, you know, it's impossible to extricate sexual fantasy from how it is that Americans have seen their wars and seen their others. And oftentimes that's very explicitly imagined in heterosexual terms, right? There's all kinds of heterosexual um, and heteronormative stereotypes and imageries, imagery that we have about the people we go to war with and that we colonize, et cetera. Um, and so we're dealing with the Vietnamese or Asian American context, obviously, Orientalist kind of fantasies about Asians being submissive and weak, whether they're male or female, are prevalent. But underlying all of that is also homoerotic tension as well. And sometimes that's very explicit, as in uh, homosexual relationships or homosexual fantasies between people of different cultures, but oftentimes it's implicit that the homoerotic becomes coded, not um, not, not allowed to be expressed explicitly. And so it becomes homosocial or becomes suppressed 
homoeroticism, which manifests itself in very terrible ways, right? And in the novel, I, I, again, there were certain boundaries that I thought I couldn't cross because of who my character was. It would probably be too much to make him actually bisexual or too much to make him, uh, you know, latently gay, right? But I nevertheless wanted to acknowledge that homoeroticism, homosociality exists, and that's why certain kinds of characters are in this book and certain kinds of uh, gestures are, are being made. Um, one of the things I noticed the most about the sympathizer is the sense of namelessness that you really created and the narrator doesn't have a name and there's these um, generic terms for each character, you know, the altor and the general. I was wondering if you could expand on that and uh, if that's a commentary on like greater movements or forms in the symphony. Yeah, I think that, you know, in writing the book, I was really focused on the question of style. Like, how's, this, how's, how's the prose going to be read? What's the texture of the prose going to be like? And I really wanted it to be sort of very smooth on the surface, not to have any kinds of interruptions. So that's another reason why there's like no quotation marks, for example. Some people are really irritated by this. You know, why do I have quotation marks? Well, when we speak, we don't have quotation marks. I'm not going like this all the time. And, um, the, so in the, na the namelessness is partly a function of that, is to continue that kind of smooth discourse uh, and seamlessness at the level of the prose. It's also philosophical to some extent. These characters, and especially my, my, my narrator, feels anonymous. He feels like he doesn't really belong anywhere. And that's reflected in the fact that he's never given a name, right? What's also happening is that the movie plays a significant part in this book. And as you see, when the credits of the movie rolls, the Vietnamese people don't have names in the movie. They're cast as crazy whore, guy in whorehouse, you know, VC terrorist number one. That's pretty much how it works even today, right? In movies about other people who aren't white that Hollywood makes. Um, and so that's also what the namelessness is a commentary about. And the fact that uh, people are given titles rather than names is an expression of that. It's also an, the, you know, the, the, the ability to give names is powerful and the ability to take names away is powerful. So in a sense, that's what the narrator is doing. Even if he's rendering himself anonymous, he's also taking away the names of, of not just Vietnamese people, but of Americans and white people as well, and that can also be something that I think uh, people find dis uncomfortable because they don't want to have their names taken away from them. But here it's kind of his revenge also. Hey, how's it going? Um, just a quick question back here. Uh, hi, I'm Brenner London. Um, I wanted to know if you had any like regrets that, like after publishing the book or any like thematic concept that you wish you like pushed more? Or, like, yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> I think, I think, truthfully, I can say no. I don't have regrets. I I I, I know what some of the criticisms of the books are. The book is because I'm an I, I'm an obsessive reader, not just of you know reviews that are published in <coughs> newspapers and so on, but of Goodreads and Amazon.com. Many authors hate reading these things because they're like, oh my god, these re these readers are stupid. You know, how can they misread my book in this way? I have no idea if, if, the, these, if the readers on Amazon.com and Goodreads are misreading the book. They have their opinions, and they think I did a bad job in this respect or I did a bad job in that respect, but it hasn't changed my mind. You know, I think that the book uh, can't really please everybody. There are certain kinds of aesthetic decisions that I make that I know are going to push people's buttons, right? And we can run down the whole list if you want, but I, I don't regret making any of those kinds of decisions because I think the book is designed to make people uncomfortable. And some people will enjoy that feeling of discomfort and some people won't. I think the issues that I, that I worry about have to do with representation. Like I, you, know, you brought the, the, the question of the Vietnamese daughter and I, and I worried in writing the, that book. About halfway through I realized, oh my god, my narrator's a sexist pig. You know, but that's who he is. So what am I supposed to do about it? Like I can't all of a sudden, you know, make him into a feminist simply because I think that's the right thing to do. Um, so I had to try to figure out how to deal with these questions, for example, in gender and representation and feminism in other ways by having other characters in there. 
And so, you know, one of my, my big questions about the book is, even though he's a sexist pig and there's a lot of sexism and a lot of terrible things that are happening and uh, to women and about women, whether or not the, the representations of women are still compelling, whether or not there's a justification for the book to depict gender and, 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 and gender relations in this fashion. You know? So it's not a regret, it's a question that I have. Um, and uh, I don't know what the answer is to that. As a reader, through man, I received perspectives of both the North and South Vietnam, and uh, this was the first compared to other narratives that I've read. So um, my question is, as a writer, what did you anticipate the initial reaction of the Vietnamese American community to be uh, trying to capture both of these perspectives, and was the reaction what you anticipated? Well, <clears throat> again, I think there's two, at least two Vietnamese American communities, the one that speaks mostly in Vietnamese and the one that speaks mostly in English, right? And um, I was hoping that um, for the community that spoke in English that they would be really receptive to the book, you know, because I, I feel that, I, you know, we share generational sympathies, right? And that seems to be true for the most part, that the feedback that I've gotten from Vietnamese American readers of that generation, my generation uh, and younger, has been really good. You know, I, think that, I think that many of us come from the situation of feeling, you know, we grew up in, in situations where people were just shouting at each other all the time and not listening to other people's points of view. So we didn't want to read another book that simply assert, asserted one perspective. So that it was important for this book to assert the comparative perspective, right? That that would be important in and of itself. What I didn't know is how the older Vietnamese community or the community that speaks in Vietnamese, how they would react to the book. And I still, I'm still not certain, I mean, because I think it's only beginning to be read or it has been read by a small number of people uh, from that population. And the ones who can read in English, I think, are already of a certain kind of background where they're already sort of literary and inclined to be open-minded about certain kinds of issues. And those people have been very enthusiastic about the book, too. So, and I think, you know, Vietnamese people have no problem telling you to your face if they don't like you or your work. So the fact that that hasn't happened yet is a good sign. It's not just silence, you know, that they're being polite. Um, but I think there's still um, a larger audience out there who may have heard of the book but haven't read it yet. And I'm, I don't know how they're going to react once the book may be, might be translated into Vietnamese. As I was reading the book, um, I sensed throughout this kind of pervasive nihilism that the protagonist was constantly encountering. And as I was reading, when he reached the end, when he really reaches his enlightenment, and he realizes that there's nothing, or at least he confesses that there's nothing, and that kind of stuff. Um, I was wondering if this was one of those books that was intended to warn us against nihilism as a kind of a, um, an ontology that ultimately will lead towards corruptions of all sorts. Um, or if it's something that just kind of exposes and say, hey, we are nihilistic, so make it what it is. And, and I reached a point in the book where I actually wrote in my little notes, like really, as I was disappointed with the protagonist. If you don't mind, let me read just a little bit. Um, it says, why do those who call for independence and freedom take away independence and freedom? And is it sane or insane to believe, as so many around us apparently do, in nothing? And so far, so good. And then this is the line. We can only answer these questions for ourselves, which is ultimately a nihilist answer. It's ultimately kind of a Nietzschean response to what the world is. And I'm wondering if you were trying to warn us or prompt us towards that or to say, hey, this is what we got. It's up to us to form our own identities or so forth. I have a comment on that. Well, you know, I love Nietzsche because I'd be in my book with a, my epigraph is from on the genealogy of morals, right? Which I only discovered about you know two thirds of the way through the book. I thought, oh, that's perfect. I got to put that in there. And um, but you know, honestly, when I wrote the novel, I had no idea how it was going to end. You know, and only about two thirds of the way through did I realize how it was going to end. And the, I think the book fits into one of the genres that it fits into is the genre of disillusionment with ideology. You know, there's a lot of books like this. Um, and typically how these books end is the narrator is disillusioned and he has to start over. And that's exactly what happens here in this book. So in, in one sense, 
I, I don't think the book is an endorsement of nihilism. It ends on that note. But the book, his story is not finished yet. And I realized that when I finished the book. I thought, I, gotta, I, gotta, I need to keep on writing about this guy, because what happens to him? It's, 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 a, it's a good ending to end with starting over, right? But I, I wanted to see where he would go after that and what he would do with this knowledge of nothingness. And there's, that's where I think the book is also not nihilistic, ultimately, because the fact that he realizes that there's nothing and that nothing has a duality of meaning is what prevents it from being nihilistic. If we only think of nothing as one thing, we're like, ah, there's, there's no God, we're fucked. Yeah, okay, that's nihilistic. You know, but you know, his, his point is that nothing is actually something. Doing nothing is actually doing something for which you're responsible. He does nothing at a crucial point in the book, and he's held responsible for that. All of us have done nothing at some point, you know, and, and we get away with it oftentimes. So he realizes that nothing is nothing, but nothing is also something. And that's what I think prevents the book from being nihilistic in the end. Well, I, I think that in, in many ways, things obviously haven't changed in Hollywood, right? We just have new villains, new minorities, and so on, and Hollywood does exactly the same thing as it's always done. And that's partially because a lot of money is involved in Hollywood. A lot of people have their preconceptions about what, the, what, the, what films should do. So it's hard to be an independent artist in Hollywood. If you're a poet, no one cares. You can say whatever you want. You can do the most radical, empathetic kind of work, and it's partially because no money is involved. So, but once you get involved in Hollywood, then you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. And that totally constrains your aesthetic ability, your artistic vision. So that being said, I think there's still hope. Um, a, lot of a lot of Vietnamese Americans I know who had a hard time getting ahead in Hollywood decided, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to go to Vietnam and make movies instead. And lo and behold, they're movie stars, they're making big budget movies in Vietnam. <laughs> Some of the most successful filmmakers in Vietnam are Vietnamese Americans. Now, that's a bad thing in the sense that they didn't do it in Hollywood, but on the other hand, they show that you can do it in other kinds of places. And so we're not really bound anymore to this idea that the United States is our only destination. That in the globalized world, for Asian Americans, for example, it's possible to imagine our destinies elsewhere. That we can be global instead of being stuck with as if Hollywood was the only option. But even within the context of the United States and Hollywood, there's still possibilities for maneuver, for a struggle, right? And we still need people to stay here and to work within the industry. And as I was talking about with some of, some of the other uh, folks up front, you know, Aziz Ansari, great example. You know, Netflix, Master of None, you should all watch it. Episode three or four, three, I think, is his meditation on what it means to be an Indian American actor in the, the film industry. And it's both a condemnation of it in, in some of the similar terms as to what I do, but also because he exists and he was able to make this series is an example that there's, there's a possibility for transformation to happen. So do you think a uh, film version of The Sympathizer itself could be an answer to that? <sighs> That's like a Dr. Fal that's like a, you know, the, the devil asking a question. <laughs> then he'd be like, hey, Sofia Coppola is giving you $5 million to make, you know, to buy your movie rights. Will you do it? Will I do it? I was like, yeah, I'll do it. And then, uh, you know, it, it would be totally, you know, a totally horrible movie. Um, I, I don't know. I think it's really hard because there's so much happening in, in the book. I, I have a hard time imagining a two-hour, three-hour movie being made about it. Um, someone else told me who has more experience in writing screenplays. Well, 
you know, what, what would happen is they would just make a movie out of one part of the book, which to me would feel like a total violation, right? But maybe they, you could make a good movie out of that. Um, or else, you know, the real fantasy I have is, you know, HBO will buy it, and then they'll make a 10-part series out of it. That would, that would make much more sense to me, you know. But again, this is all in the world realm of, you know, wishful fantasy. <laughs> So I think we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming and joining and listening and having a great conversation. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.